characteristics of the new heaven. The Bible provides us with glimpses of the characteristics of the new heaven, offering a beautiful picture of what awaits believers in the presence of God. One of the key characteristics of the new heaven is its purity and perfection. In Revelation, John describes the new Jerusalem, which is a symbol of the new heaven as a place of absolute beauty and holiness. This passage paints a picture of a city that is pure and undefiled, symbolizing the perfection and holiness of the new heaven. Another characteristic of the new heaven is the absence of pain, sorrow, and death. This verse speaks to the complete eradication of all forms of suffering and sorrow in the new heaven, highlighting the perfect peace and joy that will characterize this new creation. The characteristics of the new heaven are marked by purity, perfection, joy, and eternal fellowship with God. It is a place where all the sorrows and struggles of this present life will be no more and believers will experience the fullness of God's presence and love for all eternity. In addition to its purity, perfection, and absence of pain, the new heaven is characterized by its eternal nature. Unlike the present world, which is subject to decay and destruction, the new heaven will endure forever, serving as an everlasting dwelling place for God's people. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5 proclaims, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. This verse emphasizes the eternal nature of the new heaven and underscores the reliability of God's promise to make all things new. Furthermore, the new heaven is characterized by its accessibility to all believers Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, John writes, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who's thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. This verse highlights the inclusivity of the new heaven, inviting all who are thirsty for spiritual fulfillment to partake in the blessings of eternal life. The Fulfillment of the New Heaven The fulfillment of the new heaven represents the culmination of God's redemptive plan for humanity, bringing about a state of complete renewal and restoration. The book of Revelation provides us with a vivid description of the fulfillment of the new heaven. This passage reveals that the fulfillment of the new heaven involves the creation of a new earth, where God's presence will be fully realized among His people, it symbolizes the restoration of all things to their original state of perfection, free from the effects of sin and decay. The fulfillment of the new heaven also signifies the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. This passage speaks to the complete eradication of sin and its consequences, ushering in a state of perfect peace, joy, and wholeness for all eternity. The fulfillment of the new heaven signifies God's ultimate redemption plan promising a future without pain, sorrow, or death. Believers eagerly anticipate this future, knowing God's faithfulness to fulfill His promises. The Timing of the New Heaven The timing of the new heaven is a topic that has sparked much debate and speculation among theologians. While the exact timing is not explicitly stated in the Bible, there are several passages that offer insights into when this glorious event might take place. One key passage that addresses the timing of the new heaven is found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-9. through 9. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-9. through 9. This passage suggests that in God's eyes, time is not the same as it is for us. It emphasizes God's patience and His desire for all people to come to repentance before the fulfillment of the new heaven. Another passage that speaks to the timing of the new heaven is found in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. This verse highlights the uncertainty surrounding the exact timing of the new heaven, 
emphasizing that it is known only to God the Father. While the timing of the new heaven remains a mystery, these passages remind us of the importance of living in readiness in anticipation of this future event. They also serve as a reminder of God's patience and His desire for all people to come to repentance before the fulfillment of His promise. Will we remember our earthly lives when we are in heaven? It's important to note that the prophecy about the new earth doesn't mean that our memories will be erased. Rather, it suggests that the new environment will be so amazing and awe-inspiring that we will forget about the struggles and imperfections of our current world. The child who feels scared of the shadows in their room at night completely forgets their fear the next day on the playground. It's not that the memories have been erased, but rather that they don't come to mind in the sunshine. When a believer dies, they go to heaven, but it's not their final destination. It's important to distinguish between the current heaven and the eternal state. The Bible speaks of a future, new heaven and a new earth. That will be our permanent home. The verses Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 and Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 refer to this eternal state, which will come after the tribulation, the final judgment, and the recreation of the universe. Only then will the promise of wiping away all tears be fulfilled. In this apocalyptic vision, John sees sorrow in heaven. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. When he, the Lamb, broke open the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained out of loyalty to Christ. They cried in a loud voice, saying, O Lord, holy and true, how long now before you will sit in judgment and avenge our blood on those unregenerate ones who dwell on the earth? John is described as being in heaven in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. He sees and hears those who remember the injustice done to them. Their loud calls for vengeance suggest that in the current heaven, we will remember our lives on earth, both the good and the bad. However, it's important to note that the current heaven of Revelation 6 is temporary, and it will give away to the eternal state mentioned in Revelation chapter 21. The story of Lazarus and the rich man, mentioned in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, is a proof that the departed souls remember their previous lives on earth. In the story, the rich man who is in Hades asks Abraham to send Lazarus back to earth to warn his brothers about the punishment that awaits those who lead unrighteous lives, as mentioned in verses 27 through 28. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man remembers his relatives and his life of self-serving and sinful comfort while in Sheol, which only adds to his misery. Although it is not mentioned whether Lazarus has memories, Abraham is aware of the happenings on earth. It is only in the eternal state that the righteous will be free from all sorrow. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. for These words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Revelation chapter 21 verses 5 through 6. The idea that God will make everything new may appear too fantastic to be true, but he claims that this promise is faithful and true. His people will be completely satisfied in the new creation, which is symbolized here by the metaphor of thirst being quenched from the spring of life's water. When you're thirsty, the refreshing satisfaction of downing a cold glass of water pales in comparison to the spectacular satisfaction that awaits you. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God and they will be my children. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Every saved person will live in the new creation, but the Christian who is fully committed, the one who conquers, will inherit an even greater reward, and God will dwell with him with greater intimacy as a father does with his son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Revelation chapter 21, verse eight. 
The description of heaven is interrupted by a brief reminder that those who continue to sin and rebel against God will spend eternity in the lake of fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Unbelievers, with their unglorified bodies and unredeemed souls, will enter a place where all of their problems from this life will be magnified with no hope of improvement. They will be imprisoned in the consequences of their sinfulness to varying degrees. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 11. One of the seven angels, who had been holding the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues, shows John the new Jerusalem. Revelation 16. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and who keeps his clothes, that is, stays spiritually ready for the Lord's return, so that he will not be naked, spiritually unprepared, and men will not see his shame. And they, demons, gathered the kings and armies of the world together at the place which in Hebrew is called har Magedon, Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne of God, saying, It is done. It is all over. It is all accomplished. It has come. And there were flashes of lightning and loud rumblings and peals of thunder. And there was a massive earthquake. Nothing like it has ever occurred since mankind originated on the earth. So severe and far-reaching was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God kept in mind Babylon the Great, to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce and furious wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains could be found. And giant hailstones, as heavy as a talent, fell from the sky on the people. The people reviled and spoke abusively of God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so very great. Although believers will live throughout the new creation, the angel directs John's attention to the capital of the new earth. The city will shine brighter than a cut diamond because it will be adorned with God's glory. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 21, verses 12 through 14. The city's massive high wall symbolizes its inhabitants' identity. First, the name of Israel's 12 tribes, sons, are inscribed on the gates, indicating that Old Testament Israel believers will be present within it. Second, the city wall is depicted with 12 foundations, each with the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb written on it. This denotes the presence of believers from the New Testament era's church. The Lord's old, the new covenant followers will coexist in the new creation. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. Revelation chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. The angel measures the city, its gates, and its wall, revealing that it is a cube of 12,000 stadia in length, width, and height. A stadia is about 600 feet long, so each dimension of the city is about 1,400 miles long, roughly half the distance from New York to Los Angeles. The height is the most mind-boggling aspect of these dimensions. It's a multi-story city that rises, and it's only the capital of God's new creation. The city's wall will be 144 cubits thick, or about 72 yards thick. The wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, 
the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, turquoise, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. Revelation chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. The wall will be constructed of jasper, a translucent gemstone. City will be made entirely of gold. The city wall's foundations are to be adorned with every type of jewel. The list is incomprehensible. Each of the 12 gates will be made of a single pearl, and the city's main street will be made of pure gold. This is where we get the idea that in our eternal home, there are streets of gold, not of tar or cement, but of gold. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. During the tribulation and millennium, there will be a temple in Jerusalem. However, there will be no temple in the New Jerusalem because a physical representation of God's presence is no longer required. His direct presence will be with us. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 through 26. There will be no need for the sun or moon in the city, because the glory of God will illuminate it, and its lamp will be the Lamb. Our sun is 93 million miles away, but its power is enough to illuminate the earth. God's presence, on the other hand, can easily replace the sun because the Lord possesses even greater power and radiance. The fact that there will never be night there implies that believers' glorified bodies will never tire and need to sleep. Furthermore, we will not become bored. On the new earth, nations and kings will function in a national context, bringing their glory and honor into the city. Everyone will visit the new Jerusalem as the pinnacle of their lives on the new earth. And why not, given its magnificence? Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. While the invitation to dwell in the city is universal, the requirements to enter are specific. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who have accepted Jesus as their Savior by faith.